so much for joining us today. Can you start off by telling us a little bit about what Stirk Solutions is, how it got started, and ultimately like what remote sensing or licensing even is? Okay, sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, Stirk Solutions is basically my uh, professional engineering company, and it's the outlet by which I do business with people and, and help them or uh, sometimes just help them. Uh, so lately, uh, lately being in the last 10 or 15 years, uh, most or all of what we do has become uh, helping people with regulatory affairs and uh, getting into space, basically. And Strict Solutions is now uh, now two people, so I have a you know uh, the next generation is coming online. Put it that way. As as I see in all these missions, uh, the next generation is exciting. But we can get more into that in a few minutes, hopefully. Uh, the business of of regulatory affairs and say why is uh, why is getting into space a regulated issue. This has to do with uh, the fact, I guess, starting that space is pretty big, and uh, space is uh, space is transnational, obviously, and uh, it's it's not in any country, and so we have to guide us for good behavior, getting along in the common space, uh, the International Space Treaty. And the International Space Treaty, to which the United States and uh, very many other countries are signators, uh, governs uh, the, our behavior in outer space. It's a start at, at space law, so to say. It's a start at figuring out how we're going to get along with each other as we come off the Earth's surface and go other places. And one of the things we've agreed to is uh, the use of radios in space. Uh, we're going to transmit so that we don't bother one another and so that we have an excellent chance of our own radios working. And so deriving from international law, then we've got national regulations administered by the Federal Communications Commission about mm, how we do radios in space. So when we go into space, uh, we typically will be using radios because the our most of the missions that have ever been done, most of the missions that are being done now are gathering information. And the way we get the information back is by radios. And uh, just coming over the horizon, we're also getting information back possibly with lasers. And we're considering how that might be guided and regulated as well. Uh, so that in a nutshell is the basis for regulation of radio behavior in space it's so we can all get along. And similarly, we regulate the use of cameras in space or more generally remote sensing. Uh, remote sensing is images or videos or pictures or other things that uh, might capture, uh, capture information about things happening on earth or things happening in space. And for that, uh, uh, the NOAA CRSRA is the regulatory agency to whom we go to make sure that what we're doing is consistent with uh, the needs of national security, while at the same time, uh, NOAA is very interested in encouraging the development uh, of technology for remote sensing in space. So again, it's, it's putting some guardrails on what we're doing without trying to constrain what we're doing excessively. So that's a nutshell of uh, why we have something called regulatory affairs in space. I'm going to add one other thing in there. Uh, so we don't want to take pictures of things that would be inconvenient to other people. We don't want to broadcast radio that's going to get on top of other people's radio. And the other thing we don't want to do is we don't want to run into other people's satellites or bonk people on the head if our satellite deorbits. And that's what called uh, that's covered by what's called an orbital debris assessment report, and uh, so yeah, we look at all those things for people to try to help them get into space and do the things, the important things and interesting things that they want to do. Sure. Now I know you through SmallSat, and specifically, I was referred to you uh, when we first, uh, you know, we first worked on our uh, our first satellite. 
have you always been affiliated with primarily uh, small sats or cube sats? Uh, but that industry, as we know, has only been around, you know, 20 years and it really has exploded in the last 10. Were you involved with regulatory affairs for, say, satellites prior to the CubeSat revolution? Or is this sort of our super niche cottage industry that has just exploded and you are the right guy in the right place at the right time? Well, I don't know about the last part, but I can tell you that I did get the first the first satellite that I ever worked on was a 3U CubeSat called GeneSat-1. I had the pleasure oh. of, of working with those folks and that was the, so, so I, have seen, I have come into the, uh, the business of space along with CubeSats. That, that was at Ames, right? That was a NASA CubeSat at, at Ames in California? That's correct. The oh, astrobiology great. department at NASA Ames uh, did that project. Uh, I was working for John Hines, a uh, fine gentleman, and uh, a real innovator in space. Uh, I had the privilege to do that, and uh, it was it was a great first mission, and things okay. kind of went from there. I have a question regarding, obviously, the idea that we are not just going to space alone, right? That we're doing this with multiple nations or things like that, no one owns that. So if we have regulatory agencies here, do all space going nations or, you know, with the intent to do that also have regulatory companies that are doing the same thing? Okay, good question. Uh, the regulatory uh, activity, the, the regulators vary from one country to another, as you can imagine. Each country has its own tradition of law, but we also are fortunate to have the International Telecommunications Union, which sits above all, so to say, and is the final arbiter of the implementation of the Outer Space Treaty, I would say, in, in many ways. So uh, we have an international body, the ITU, that, uh, that everybody reports up to, so to say, and checks in with, and uh, and they maintain the master database of all the satellites launched by all the countries. Do, uh, do nations such as, say, North Korea, do they listen to the ITU? Uh, do you ever have rogue players that just say, we're going to do our own thing and we don't really uh, respect the authority of the ITU? Have you ever seen that? That's a good question, Kevin. And I guess I guess if somebody was going to be a rogue player, he probably wouldn't first think to get in touch with me. So uh, <laughs> I haven't heard from them. And so the I, I have no idea. The, the no North idea. Koreans don't call Sturk solutions. No, they, okay. they, I haven't got any calls from North Korea. Uh, we would we would certainly take their call if they checked I in. I bet you would. Uh, I have one quick short follow-up. How did you, now my understanding is you reside in Montana. So how, how did you get involved with satellites being in a state that's pretty far away from a lot of NASA activity, such as California or Florida or Texas? What, what does the secret uh, behind your company location in Montana? Well, the reason I'm located in Montana is because I grew up here and I spent the, you know, the, the sort of uh, broad middle part of my career uh, in California doing various interesting things and, and having fun there. I also spent uh, some of the early part of my career in Montana working on magnetohydrodynamics, which is a, a fascinating but little explored field th these days. Uh, anyway, I, my wife and I moved back to Montana in 2004 uh, when we just thought it would be fun to have a change. Uh, we, we've enjoyed all the places we've lived and we enjoy living here too. So that's, uh, I, we, I went to high school in a very small town in Montana mm -hmm. and uh, we had a place there. So we decided to come back there and see how we liked it and uh, okay. whatever. That's been a long time and we still like it, I guess. So that's so how I got back to Montana. That's why I'm here. This question may be complete. I may be completely wrong in my understanding, but one of our students at one point were looking at developing for our, a debate tournament a piece of legislation that involved monitoring activity in Antarctica. The idea that the Chinese, you know, were coming over and kind of like taking those waters. Does remote sensing with the idea of imaging work in something like that, where these international waters also are coming into play? With, I mean, I know it's not space, but they are in space taking pictures of something like that. 
Yes, if you're in space taking pictures the, and, and you're operating from the United States, then you would want to check in with NOAA CRSRA and uh, they, in a situation like you described, they would probably say, yes, you, you need to apply for a license. Right. And so, yeah, that would be a licensed activity, taking pictures of stuff on the Earth's surface. Right. Well, uh, yeah. with respect to not only just remote sensing, but as I, I mentioned earlier, well, my primary experience with you has been dealing with the Federal Communications Commission. So what was your first experience with the FCC? And I'm going to open this question up. And do you believe that they are adjusting well to this explosion of these constellations of satellites? Uh, I know there was always concern when you're wanting to get a license. Will you get your license before you run out of time you know, and need to integrate your vehicle? Uh, could you speak to that, your uh, initial dealings with the FCC, where you see them now, and uh, what I would think is the backlog of applications or paperwork for folks like us and all the way to Elon Musk wanting to launch thousands of satellites? Wow, well, that's a, that's a broad question, Kevin, but I'll try to take it from the top, starting with my own initial experience with FCC. As I said, that was on GeneSat-1. That was the first satellite I supported, and uh, that was, uh, I'll say this, I, I approached the job from a position of uh, appropriate humility because I hadn't done it before. And I found the FCC to be very helpful in explaining to me what they needed in order for them to do their job, which they considered then as now to be giving us a license. Uh, you know, we need to uh, follow the rules of the uh, radio road and they need to issue us a license. And that's, uh, that's the relationship that I've had with the FCC since. In terms of adjusting to the explosion of small satellites, which there certainly is, I would say uh, hats off to the FCC. I mean, if you, if you plot the number of satellites per year who apply to get radio licenses and compare that with the FCC staffing, I think one is a pretty flat line and then one is exponentially increasing mm -hmm. and that represents a tough job. And then, okay, if I can overlay onto that a plot of regulations becoming dynamic and increasingly complex, I would say a new wrinkle comes up every two or three months that they have to implement. Uh, I think they're doing great. I think that I, I would I would rather have my job than their job, bottom line. Got it. Well, as we're talking, I'm trying to look at some other legislation that I remember working on after we met you, the kids, uh, we had also, I think, gone to MIT closely in relation to that. And so there was a conception, at least with the, and it may be a misconception, that there was a lot of streamlining that could be done when it came to licensing, uh, particularly with the FCC. Would you say that that's true, that there's a lot of maybe overlapping bureaucracy that could in some ways be tightened up to reflect our modern society a little bit more? Of course, things could be improved. And, and you mentioned the term stream, streamlining specifically. And that's interesting because uh, the a, that is how FCC refers to their streamlined process for Part 25 applications. That's part 25, I, think, I couldn't remember. Yep, Part 25. Which, which is huge. It's a huge thing. Essentially, uh, if, you, if you look at the entire industry and look out on the whatever the right side of the progression uh, where things become commercialized and industrialized and people use space to do things that hopefully benefit mankind and generate lots of commerce and stuff like that. Uh, that's when you move from the experimental licensing regime, which, uh, which you know, all of us in, in the education business are concerned with into the commercial licensing, which mm -hmm. is covered by a, a different part of the federal regulation, okay, part 25 in this case. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, so the streamlined part 25 has really, in my opinion, lowered the, the requirement, lowered the effort and the time that it takes 
for a commercial applicant to get their stuff into space. And okay. that's a, I know the FCC worked really hard on it. They got input from everybody that they could possibly get input from and rolled it all into uh, this streamlined part 25 regulation. So yes, it's something that's very important. Yes, it's something that I've seen them doing. And I would expect to see more of the same going forward. Right. So you'd call that a little bit of good government, Progress. right? Some good government there? I would say it's, uh, yes. Yeah, I would. I'd say it's it's good, good, good improving. It's people trying to do the best they can. I mean, uh, remember that that organizations like the FCC don't totally set policy, they implement policy. Right. Okay, and, and our elected officials are supposed to develop and improve and, and evolve policy. And I think they're working on that. Uh, again, that's a harder job than I've got, where they're you're trying to anticipate what we're gonna need in two or three or four years, uh, what the demands of people going into space will be, and try to make regulations that, that keep us on the right path while keep us going down the path I, that's a big job that a lot of people are working on. I remember when we were thinking along the lines after talking with you, and then we went uh, and spoke at some of the labs there at MIT, one of the problems that they they shared with us, they thought, uh, was that the number of satellite applications versus the number of people who are able to work on the licensing was exponentially higher in the one and that there almost needed to be more people um, almost doing what you're doing. Is, is that something that's been alleviated? Is that the number is overwhelmingly larger than the people who are able to input the information? Well, I, again, as I said, if, if you know, my, my verbalization of a graph is, yeah, you've got a, a pretty much of a flat line that's the staff at FCC, and you've got this exponential curve that's number of satellites. Now, that, the fact that you know, the fact that the work is getting done and people are getting licensed indicates somebody's probably staying up late at night. Right, to right. Get it done. And that's why it takes longer, obviously, if you have fewer people with the amount that was coming in. I remember it's just it's all coming back to me as we're talking about the, the levels of conversations I had with the students who are also trying to understand why. Why does it take why does anything seem to take so long? You expect, you know, instant gratification, at least kids do, right? Um, I have I have a couple of questions. One, I just for our listeners, the FCC, is it an independent government entity or is it within an umbrella of a larger agency or organization? Okay, now this is my quiz in U.S. government 101, and I'm not going to answer this very well, so I bet I won't okay. get any better than a C- minus on what I say. My understanding is the FCC is, is an independent commission that is okay. not part of, of one of the, the main uh, departments of government. Okay. The follow-up question is, I have two-parter. First part, does the FCC have the authority to collaborate, for instance, with other nations, or do they only coordinate, for instance, with the ITU? or what kind of relationship if it's not one of those two? Okay, I am, I am unaware of the FCC having bilateral agreements with other countries, but again, it, you know, I, I'm, it's become, it's, it probably becomes apparent, my knowledge of the structure of US government is probably incomplete, but uh, certainly the FCC has a constant and ongoing dialogue with the ITU. Mm -hmm. And my observation, all, all the correspondence I see from other countries, okay, regulators in other countries comes through the ITU okay. and into the FCC. All right. The Now my final question on that sort of theme is, maybe I heard it at small set, maybe you were telling a story or someone about there were some small sets, I believe there were cube sets, and I think they were launched from India, and they somehow got through without a license a few years ago. Could you share that story with our viewers? Well, I'm not, that, that story has been, been played out a lot, and I don't know if I'm going to characterize it, but yes, through a series of events, satellites were launched that didn't have licenses, and I, that's, 
that's a real no-no. That's taken very seriously. That's uh, like driving without a driver's license times 1,000 or something. It, that's a really bad thing to do. And of course, everybody in the community, the regulators and the, uh, the operators and everybody felt really bad about that because when something like that happens, it means there's, it, it, it gives the appearance of a need for uh, more oversight mm -hmm. directed towards everyone. Uh, and uh, there, there were fines levied, there were sanctions levied, as I recall, on, on the operators. Uh, and, uh, you know, but it's not like the world stopped going around. Right. It, that, was, that was a bad thing. And everybody, I mean, everybody in the business is extremely careful about that. You, you just don't do it. You just don't do it. And there are checks all along the way that, to make sure that doesn't happen again. Uh, I can't tell you why it happened initially. I, you know, that's in the fine structure of, of the you know, regulatory sanction as, as to why it played out the way it did. But I would be very surprised if it happened again. Sure. It, I, I can't tell, I can't recall if Space Flight Industries was the integrator for that event, but they were our integrator for, as you know, YSAT-1. And by the time it, we came around, they said, you don't even need to come to integration unless you have your license in hand, right? There's, we're not going to put your CubeSat in the tube, you know, in the Peapod until you have a license. So they, if they were not involved with that incident, they were sensitive enough by the time we came around in 2018 that we certainly were not going to be allowed anywhere near, you know, completing our task without that license. That's right. And any launch integrator I'm aware of applies those same standards. Mm -hmm. There is, they're, they're just, you know, there's very early interdiction, so to say, or hitting the pause button if you don't have a license. And so part of our success criteria is to get the license in plenty of time which we then push back on our clients and say, that means you have to start early. If you want to finish early, you have to start early. It's really hard to go faster mm -hmm. than the speed of light in the regulatory regime. Absolutely. Well, speaking of starting early, if we have some listeners who have never done this before and they're thinking this is something they can do, what is a general estimation for how long from start for the application process to finish, just as a ballpark figure? Okay. I'd say um, you want to have your application complete and in at least 90 days before you need the license. And be sure to, you know, just like you teach your kids in the math class, be sure to include all of the factors. Uh, one is when you're going to launch, but as we just pointed out, that's not when you need the license. The launch integrator will tell you when you need the license. The person that you're going to hand your satellite to, who we can expect, will say, I want you to show up with a satellite in one hand and a license in the other. That's not as bad as I thought, 90 days. I, I, I mean, yeah, that I, seems very reasonable. <laughs> but I, I think that uh, people playing it safe may um, even double that time right, just right. to play it safe. Doubling that time is an act. Well, I would say if you talk about when you're going to start your licensing, doubling that time is really good because my experience is it takes quite a while to assemble all of the documents that are needed for the application. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's, we ask different questions and, and any project goes that way. You have, you know, optimism on the early part and panic yeah. on the end. And so, right. uh, so anyway, yeah, if we would like to be working with people six months before they need the license, at least, and then we feel we could do a pretty good job. Right. I, I believe you mentioned ODAR, the Orbital Debris Assessment Report, earlier in our yes. uh, interview. Now, is that a requirement for the FCC? And, and why do you think the FCC, if it is, why do they require the NASA report on you know, your materials of construction, uh, that, that seems like maybe a little disconnect between your use of a radio and the frequencies and, you know, what kind of aluminum or printed circuit board you have in your vehicle. 
Okay, uh, so so the, the question would be, why is FCC the reviewer of your ODAR? Right. Uh, and the reason is, uh, I would say it's because everybody who builds a satellite has a radio and everybody who has a radio goes to FCC. So it's a, it's a, a default one-stop shop for getting it looked at. Uh, I think it's I think it's a pragmatic way to handle it. I'm not sure that FCC particularly, you know, has gone looking for that job because as you point out, it's outside of the term communications, but uh, they're, they're basically saying, if you've got to us without having your ODAR looked at, you're not going any further until your ODAR gets looked at. Could that be uh, maybe a congressional uh, responsibility that they've thrown on the FCC just as a like a check and balance from the federal government? I can't. I, again, uh, you know, I'm not getting high grades in government today, so uh, yeah. no, so I don't know how they uh, how FCC was handed this opportunity, uh, but yeah, that's what they do. Uh, there's that that's what they do and and um it needs to be done i mean obviously we don't want to bonk people in the head with our debris when our satellite deorbits and we don't want to be running into other satellites that's it's pretty common sense and uh yeah so uh, maybe it's a okay i'm i am uh pretty persistent with tortured analogies so let me say this is a little bit like the uh, maybe the, the Department of Motor Vehicles when they're giving you your driver's license, they come out and say, how's that seat belt working? How's those stoplights working? These right. are not measures of your ability to operate an automobile, but they look at it anyway because it's a good idea. Right. Well, my last question will kind of go around the space debris in general. So when we hear about space debris, your average person is like, well, it just seems like litter. It's kind of like how, who ultimately for our, you know, kind of new listeners is responsible for when there is debris and, and there is when, you know, when there is debris in space, is it the person who sent it up? Is it the country who sent it up? I mean, or the company? Okay. Uh, okay. There's, probably something in space law that talks about that, all right? And in terms of if I'm flying, if I put up a satellite, well, it's my property while I'm in space. And I'd say that nominally you're responsible for what happens with your property. And probably there's lots of guys who know lots about law who would jump all over me at that point and say, it's not that simple. Right. And I respect their opinion, it probably isn't. Uh, but all right, for example, if you've got two satellites that look like they're going to bump into each other, uh, which we have, we have, you know, a, a great outfit uh, that's, you know, called the 18th Air Force and at different times called different things like C Spock and J Spock and mm -hmm. probably something else now who do an uh, amazing job. I want you to think about if you were the idea of first understanding the locations and orbits of like 300,000 different objects in space. And then not only doing that, but being able to say, let's see, uh, do any two of these objects look like they're gonna try to occupy the same space at the same time and continuously right. calculating that. And these are like incredibly large numbers of calculations that they do. And then they will nicely send you a notice that says, we think that you're headed for a conjunction, which is a sanitized term for getting too close for comfort to mm -hmm. something else in space. And all right, there's, there's several possibilities. One is that you're able to adjust your orbit. All right, because they, they, they can not only do this, they can do this like lots of orbits in advance of when right. it's going to happen. It's, it's incredible. But yep. anyway, so they could, they will let the two parties know, the two owners of the objects, and uh, they're pretty much expected to work it out. Right. I, I just read recently, uh, OneWeb and SpaceX, they were sort of, you know, a, there was a, I think at first they thought they might come within a few feet of each other. It turned out to be 
maybe a thousand yards or something like that, a thousand meters. But I understand they were sort of arguing with one another about how to handle it. So that was one most recently in the news. So my final question for you, although I would like to probably bring you back sometime and let's talk more about this magneto hydrodynamic generator or engine <laughs> that you worked on, that could be a podcast in itself. Uh, but my, my, my question to you is, you have seen a lot of interesting, I think you've probably seen a lot of interesting uh, companies, universities, students, professors, payloads, engineers. Tell me, when you think back about what you've been working on and, and a really important part of these missions, which mission stood out to you as being most interesting? And I will let you use any criteria you'd like for defining what you thought is interesting. Wow. Okay, you're putting me on the spot, Kevin, because you know that I've worked on your mission. Yeah, no, you so, can't say yeah, yes. I knew yeah, that's I, what it was fishing I, for. I, I felt it. I, 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 not, yes. I, am, I would like to know, other than YSAT, any other than YSAT, which is other than YSAT, which was, of course, the most fascinating in many <laughs> ways. But okay, vying for the number two position. I mean, all right, everybody remembers their first experiences with lots of things. Right. So uh, I have to go back to GeneSat 1 and say, boy, that was pretty cool. That, that was, was pretty a fun. remarkable. That was a big NASA. I mean, that was a big deal. What was that mission for those who don't know? OK, it was, uh, it was basically a biology experiment in which uh, you know tiny little test tubes the size of a pencil eraser were injected with tiny little amounts of nutrients and then tiny little amounts of other chemicals. And each one had a really tiny little camera looking at the test tube to figure out what was going on. Wow. So yep. it was it was just the experiment was astounding. The you know, it was early days for CubeSats. Right. And uh, the fact you know, that they could send those pictures back alone, it, I would imagine something so small in such a vast. It place. was um, it was uh, bacterial. Right. And do you know. Um, and, and I don't think this is a secret because it's on a NASA webpage. They, NASA's uh, you know, extolled its uh, success with that. That satellite, um, it's probably still in order, but even though its FCC license has expired and it's not transmitting anymore, right? That's right. It's not transmitting anymore, but it had a long run. Good, good. Um, well, that, uh, yeah, the gene set, I, I am very interested because, you know, I'm, I'm a biochemist by schooling. So I am very interested in biological payloads and how we can learn, you know, how things behave differently in space. So I, I agree with you that gene set and, you know, now they sequence DNA on the space station and they're looking at the microbiome of, you know, it's got its own ecosystem up there on the ISS. So I think as we go more and more into space, understanding how life works in space is going to be that much more important. So I really, uh, I think that, yeah. I think that uh, really has been a, this half hour has flown by. I really have enjoyed uh, speaking with you. And again, I was serious. We probably should have you back to talk about this magneto hydrodynamic. I haven't come and talk to the students uh, in the, in the It Wolf seems Act. like uh, I was, when you said that, I was like, isn't that in Tom Clancy's Hunt for Red October? uh is, is that the same technology from the movie that that was mentioned in the movie uh in some versions of the story mhd was probably involved okay all right and as we close out is there if someone wanted to get in contact with you because they're now ready to launch some kind of satellite. Is there any, uh, are there any sites that you want to share out how somebody might be able to, if is there like a Facebook site, a web page, anything you want to share out? Just drop me an email. We, we, <laughs> we try to be pretty informal. So uh, they can we will share your email to I, everyone. <laughs> yes. I know uh, from our very beginning, they were like, you, you need to find Mike Miller. You need to work with Mike Miller. So you okay. obviously have a great reputation and Sturk Solutions and Honestly, we're really, uh, for our listeners, uh, Mike here is, he's also helping us and has submitted our paperwork and is shepherding our paperwork for our second CubeSat, the CapSat-1, which is scheduled to fly um, later this year and be deployed from ISS. So honestly, um, you've been good with our kids. We appreciate you always have taken time to answer all of our questions. Uh, 
we're really glad to know you. We have, I, I understand completely why you're so successful. And we really want to thank you for taking the time to uh, let us interview you today. Thank you both. It was a pleasure to be here.